Hello, listeners. I'm Tim Stradamus, and I sincerely miss you guys on Wednesdays and Fridays now. Aww. Joining me as always is my talented and beautiful co-host, this voice. Good morning, Tim Stradamus, and welcome to all of our listeners. Remember, if you decide to walk around barefoot too much, it might become a bit of a hobbit. <laughs> oh, like a, like a habit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've been watching too much Lord of the Rings. Uh. In fact, my sincere wish is that I've never seen Lord of the Rings, just so that I can watch it all over again from the beginning. You are so lame. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can tell, I seem to be on a bit of a Middle Earth run here. I would like to go ahead and give you a couple Lord of the Rings jokes. Are you ready? Okay. What do you call a gangster hobbit? A Gandolfini? <laughs> <laughs> I like that, but it's actually YOLO Swaggins. <laughs> YOLO Swaggins. Okay. That's creative. I like that. Now for my next joke. Why can't you enter Sauron's lair? Hmm. Because he lives that van life and he's always traveling, so no one knows where's at. Wow. This is a backstory we haven't heard in the original Tolkien books. Maybe he can't afford Mordor anymore. Oh, you're very close. It's because there's always one Mordor. <laughs> that's so middle earth <laughs> <laughs> for new listeners voice and i enjoy reading and talking about stories from the internet that are interesting funny and dramatic because of our love of stories we've come together and created this channel to share with you those experiences and hopefully give you some food for thought but not my precious <laughs> <laughs> well looks like we have some new shout outs to make we have more patrons to announce welcome to the tea club <laughs> you didn't do it <laughs> I just wanted to see how long you'd hold it <laughs> Welcome to the Tea Club Callie Amity, Karen Olson And Phoenix Surreal Wow you put that way out of order We're going to see where it lands <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all of your support Yes we love and appreciate every single one of you So voice So Tim Stradamus What tea have you brewed for us today? Today I brewed for you A delicious tea that I was thinking about the Roaring Twenties when I made. Was a hectic time, truly a time where our generation was really growing in America. So I added a tea that had hibiscus, rose hips, and chamomile. That way we go ahead and start off with some floral notes, but then we're gonna spice it up with some cinnamon and cloves, add in some pea flower for the color, and a little bit of orange peel for that zest. Ooh. I know you said our generations. I don't know if you meant like us because we're not that old, but. Oh, no, we're not. Yeah, no, we're not vampires. I haven't Ooh. lived since the 1920s. This is crazy. You like it? Yeah, that's a 10 out of 10. So it's got that spice in there. I imagine that probably the streets in New York were super busy. And I imagine that everybody was always up and bustling. And I wanted that spiciness. But I had to just smooth it out with some of the flour. So I added the chamomile to kind of calm down the flavors along with the hibiscus to bring in sort of that fruitiness. Rose hip sort of enhances that. Yeah. I really got into it. It's fantastic. I label this, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you go ahead and enjoy your morning cup of brew, why don't we go ahead and delve into these stories? For a first story, am I the a-hole for refusing to pay a friend who paid for my wedding dress? Hey, Reddit. Hey, I was looking to buy this dress from a brand in New York City. Because I'm not based there, the only option was to go through a retailer where I'm based at, and that would cost $2,400, excluding alterations. I found a listing from Still White, and it was the exact dress I wanted in my size and brand new. The previous owner had canceled her wedding for $900. My longtime friend from school, S., who happened to be in New York at the time, agreed to pick it up for me and bring it back with her to where I'm based, where she's also from. I was really grateful and happy, and I was even intending to gift her $100 on top of the Uber rides to and fro the place I said I would reimburse as my token of appreciation. However, my joy turned to shock, horror, dismay, disbelief, when I saw S's Instagram story showcasing her trying on my wedding dress. I called her out for it, telling her I wasn't happy she not only tried it without my permission, but posted it for the public to see. She didn't take it down even after a conversation we had about this. 
To make matters worse, she admitted she collected the dress posing as me. Through an email bill later, I noticed that the dress had also been altered. What the fuck? On the spot. All without my knowledge or consent. When confronted, S nonchalantly stated that it was her one chance to try a wedding gown and insisted I should get over it and reimburse her the $900 she paid for the dress. My wedding dress experience was entirely hijacked. I'm now hesitant to pay her back. This all happened yesterday and she reached out today to ask for money back and told me to get over it because she needs to make a big purchase tomorrow and it would help her cash flow. Since she wants it so bad, she can now have it. Am I the a-hole? Well, well, well. Looks like we're getting into the wedding stuff on a Monday. In the story, we have uh, the OP is about to get married, and she has a friend that's volunteering to pick up her dress for her. Because she's in New York at the time. Sounds like a good friendly thing to do. And she's offering to pay for her friend's um, Uber fare to and fro, and $100 on top of it just for helping out. Correct. She had one job to do. Can you imagine sitting there picking up something for your friend? As important as a dress for the wedding and telling them to make alterations on something that isn't yours without consulting the bride-to-be. This had me a bit of a bridezilla moment because, oof, I don't think any bride would be okay with this. It's not her wedding, so why would you think it's okay to make alterations to something that doesn't belong to you? Wear it, post it up on Instagram, and then refuse to take it down. What type of psyche do you have to be in to motivate yourself to do those type of things? I would imagine probably a narcissistic sort of viewpoint. When is she having the wedding? I hope that her doing that to the dress didn't impact what she's wearing at the wedding, that she has enough time to figure out another dress. Possibly. I guess we're going to find out. We are. (laughs) What I'm going to say is, obviously, you're not the a-hole and you don't owe a penny to your friend that is effectively now become her dress she paid for it she altered it that's her dress but i do hope that our op has enough time to fix the problem that her friend created i definitely agree with that and the consensus on reddit is our op is definitely not the a-hole it comes down to the dress wasn't yours you're not supposed to wear it and don't alter something that doesn't belong to you now As you probably already suspected, we do have an update. Mm. So let me go ahead and read to you this update. First of all, thank you everyone for being so empathetic and indignant on my behalf. I don't feel crazy anymore. When I saw her post, I completely lost it. I cried so pathetically. I know everyone must be wondering why I'm even friends with S and how that reflects on me as a person too. S and I go a long way back. I have always known S as a shitty friend, but I still kept her around because of her mental health struggles. I was the only friend connected to her family, so if anything, I would have been the one to sound the alarm. I don't think I could have lived with the guilt if anything really happened to S, but well, I guess my job is done because S's audacity tells me she's in a much better place. Good for her. Moving forward, I don't have the dress on hand yet because it's still in New York with her. She is coming back where we're based February 24th. I agree that she was doing me a favor, and for that, I think I would still pay her for the dress. After all, it is $900, but with the following terms. I will only pay her upon receipt of the dress. The trust is completely broken. I don't know what else she might do to the dress. Sleep in it? I unfortunately need this leverage over her until I have it in my hands, else she has no incentive to keep her hands off it. For all I know, she chucked it in a dirty storage bin to spite me. 2. I will pay her the $900 minus the cost of dry cleaning and alterations. It's like borrowing a friend's clothing and not washing it before returning it. Did I mention she also tried it after her Pilates class without showering? Huh. I think this arrangement is fair and I would not owe her anything. 3. I will end this friendship. To be honest, I think if S and I met as adults, we wouldn't be friends. The friendship has ran its course, and I think I did the best I could in this effed up situation. She for real said I'm pulling an Anna Sorokin on her. S called me a con artist and isn't even sorry that she rained all over my parade. Friend? Human? 4. She's uninvited. 
Need I say more? The fact that you're still taking the dress after she made altercations to it is a wild concept. Because what happens if she altered it to something you don't like anymore? You shouldn't have to pay for that. That's very true. Well, there's one more update. Oh? So let me go ahead and read this last one. Please be good. S had actually told me there were lipstick stains on the dress and offered to buy a stain pen. Later, I found out from the shop owner that the stains were actually caused by S. So S not only lied blatantly, but tried to cover up her vile behavior by coming across helpful. I have since reverted to S and gave her two options. One, sell it to me at half the cost to cover alterations and dry cleaning. Or two, sell it to someone else. She chose option two and showed no true remorse. End of story and friendship. Shout out to my friends and Reddit community. Happy holidays, everyone. Okay, so I guess now she's just going to go find another dress. Sounds like it. Okay. I think you'll honestly be way more happy with that, OP. Yes, and with that type of friend who needs enemies. That's why they're called frenemies. Uh, Don't keep those in your life. And she says it best herself. Had we met as adults, there's no way I'd be friends with her. If you can say that about someone in your life, that probably is your sign. Well, let's go to our next story. And just keep in mind, this is a little bit of an older post. It was posted about a year ago. For our next story, am I the a-hole for demanding my fiancé stop teaching our kids bad manners? Hi, everyone. Huh? Using a throwaway because I don't want this on my main and I would like an outside opinion. My fiancé Lola and I have been together for five years engaged for a little over a year, and we have twins, boy and girl, two and a half. Our wedding is in two months. Lola usually takes care of feeding the kids in the morning since I work early, and so I never noticed this until recently. I took a week vacation from work to just spend time at home with my kids and Lola and started to notice something that bothered me. Lola has been teaching our kids bad table manners and sees nothing wrong with it. I hadn't noticed this before, as they don't eat this type of food for lunch slash dinner slash snacks or eat it all the time, so I guess I just missed it as I wasn't home or she fed them other things on the weekends. This morning, I was helping Lola make breakfast, and then I got the kids ready while she brought their food out to them. As they were getting ready to eat, I noticed they didn't have forks slash spoons, so I told Lola I would get them and she said there was no need. I watched instead, and she gave the kids tortillas that she ripped into pieces, and they were using their bare hands to grab the food using the pieces of tortilla. I asked her what she was doing, and that she should be giving them utensils, but she seemed shocked that I was concerned, and said that's how they always eat it. I told her that she was teaching them bad manners, and making them think it was okay to just grab food with their bare hands. She told me they do that anyway when they have chips or grapes or tacos and pizza and listed a bunch of other snacks and fast food you eat without utensils. But I pointed out that those things were usually made to be eaten quickly or on the road, like fast food, so utensils aren't needed. She said I was being offensive by calling her way of eating gross and saying it was having bad manners. But I do think it's gross to see someone grabbing at food with their bare hands like that. She said she grew up eating things like that and would always use tortillas to eat things like eggs or meat, rice, beans, and that it wasn't gross because she always made the kids wash their hands before they ate. I ended up giving my kids forks for them to eat, which they didn't want to use, which made me even more frustrated with her because now they're used to this. Lola has been really annoyed the rest of the day and wouldn't let me help her with lunch. And earlier, she was walking around the house speaking to someone, probably her sister, in Spanish about me. And I'm starting to feel a bit annoyed. Am I the a-hole? Edit. Wow, lots of replies quickly. They seem to be mixed so far, but I will add in that the kids can use utensils and use them with foods like soup, pastas, etc., I just fear that allowing them to continue using their hands will make them used to it. Am I the a-hole? Well, it sounds like we have a clash of cultures happening here between our OP and his wife. They've been together for five years. They've got two kids and they've been engaged for over a year now. Good for them. Sounds like they're starting to cobble together 
a future. Now, ROP is definitely upset that his kids are using their fingers to eat. And it sounds like that's not something he really partakes in. But his wife does. So I'm guessing this is something that he's kind of looked past. And they've never had a conversation about this. That's where the problem lies here. You know, the kids are using tortillas to eat. I've seen that plenty of times in my life where silverware isn't used. And it would depend on context and what's happening. If it's a formal event or if it's something like a breakfast with family, you can teach your kids to have etiquette. And it doesn't sound like it was a conversation. It was a argument. Definitely. Where he's saying, I'm grabbing the forks and I'm giving it to them, telling them to use it. And now he's getting frustrated. They don't want to use the forks. You've got to be on the same front together. And that starts when you have conversations about how you're raising your kids together. Yeah, you might not agree on certain points, but there is give and take. My quarry would only be, why push so hard? To assume that just because they eat with their fingers at the table in an informal setting for breakfast, that they're going to carry that habit along to everything else they do in life. Let them be kids. You'll have time to teach them the right way if that's what you so choose. But slamming the fork in front of them and telling them to eat with it isn't going to get the job done. So in my opinion, OP, you would be the a-hole for doing it the way you did. Well... The consensus on Reddit is that OP is definitely the a-hole. But let me go ahead and delve a little deeper into the concerns of our Redditors. So first and foremost, OP did confirm with Redditors that Lola is Mexican and she's also white. She doesn't look Latina. She very much looks white. And I feel for Lola because I've been in similar situations. Tim Stradamus, you know, looking at me, I don't look Hispanic at all. And it's given a lot of people misconceptions about who I am as a person. I was raised with my father definitely teaching me that you need to use your silverware. And when I was with my mother, it was more freedom to go ahead and eat the way that we're supposed to eat depending on the setting. And a lot of the times it was eating with hands. Now, a lot of commenters came out saying how our OP has viewed and argued his point to his wife makes him seem racist because of the clash of the cultures here. He didn't say that he's worried about them developing bad habits. He called her way of eating gross and in fact labeled it as bad manners when for her it's not bad manners. It's just a part of how she was raised. The argument should have stopped there. And then of course based on how you put it Tim Stradamus there should have been more talks about the best ways to go forward regarding this sort of standstill. But the fact that he labeled it as gross, and then aside from that came out later on saying, now she's talking with some family member in Spanish and it's probably trash talking me now, kind of didn't paint him in a good light. May I ask this? Yes. Did he say gross in the initial story? Yes. I missed that detail. (laughs) I didn't realize that he had said it was gross and demeaning it. I can get where people are saying what they are about it. The exact words is she said I was being offensive by calling her way of eating gross and saying it was having bad manners. But I do think it's gross to see someone grabbing at food with their bare hands like that. Okay. Yeah. I glossed over that really hard because it came up twice. I find it funny because a lot of Redditors came out saying Americans eat a bunch of food with their hands. They've seen people eat turkey legs with their hands. They've seen people eat ribs with their hands. Me. (laughs) You have people that eat pizza and cheeseburgers. There's a bunch of things that you eat with your hands. So when you're talking about something being gross because you're eating it with your bare hands, it depends on what you're talking about. Because for me, it's the way that you eat, not the fact that you're picking up food with your hands. If you're literally grabbing your food and shoving it into your face in the most disgusting way, I don't think that would make anybody want to get near you. Regardless of the utensil. Now, I must say, the weirdest thing that I've seen family members do on my father's side is eat a cheeseburger with a fork and a knife. Whoa. (laughs) I found it to be the weirdest thing because- I heard that story. I have always been raised where hot dogs and cheeseburgers, those are always, it's like a sandwich. You, You eat them with your hands. When I first saw this family member do that, mind you, together, it was no place for me to say anything regarding this family member and how they ate, but it had stuck out in my mind when I was like, wow, they're using a fork and a knife? 
that's weird. I guess it does depend on how you were raised. And I see people all the time eat pizza with a fork and a knife just because they say that there's a texture problem. Yeah. I don't like greasy feelings on my finger. I will try and avoid (sighs) that as much as possible. I love a good greasy burger or pizza or uh, it adds to the fun. Thomas, you know I need a bunch of napkins if I have to eat like that. It's the weirdest thing for me. But I think it's just, it depends on how you're raised and what you're okay accepting. He definitely needs to open his eyes to more than just his culture. I get where people came from it as a, we could be talking about it being racist. And you definitely need to check yourself because, yeah, maybe there is some of that in here. Now, let me go ahead and provide you with an update on this story. Our OP says, hello again. Hi again. I'm hoping to follow all the rules so this doesn't get deleted or anything, but I wanted to post a quick update because I got a big fat reality check yesterday. I admit that at first I was annoyed and defensive that everyone was ganging up on me and saying I was racist slash an absent parent slash etc. However, surprisingly enough, it was the comments who were trying to defend me and somewhat agreeing with me that ended up changing my mind. At first, I was mainly focusing on the two to three comments in my defense, but as I read more of them, I started to realize that they were sounding racist slash disrespectful, and then I realized the rest of you are right, and that is what I sounded like in my post. There were a few comments saying something like, in America, that is not normal, but we are not in America, and hearing people say that to me while defending me was shocking to say the least. I don't want to be one of those people who goes around telling people that they need to speak a certain language or do a certain thing because of where they happen to be. I showed my wife the post, and she saw a lot of your disrespectful comments agreeing with me, calling her way of eating unhygienic, and she said they sounded like me, which made me realize I was an a-hole. For those asking if I never seen my wife eat like that, no. I hadn't, and I asked her why she never did, even though she said she grew up doing it. She told me how a few months into our relationship, I had made a comment about someone in a film being poor and weird for eating food with their hands. I do remember having said this, and it was something that I should not have said. She said that is why she didn't eat like that in front of me, but she thought I wouldn't mind if our kids did as they were toddlers and toddlers regularly eat with their hands. I am doing a lot of self-reflection and I've apologized deeply to my wife. She said she needs some time to think things through after seeing the post and my comments as well as everyone's comments, which I fully respect. Thanks everyone for your insight. Hey, that's a pretty good update. I can appreciate when someone does introspection and can hold themselves accountable. And it's really interesting the way he was able to do it by seeing people agreeing with how he was handling the situation. He got to see and hear it from other people and go, well, wait a second. This guy sounds like a complete a-hole. I sound like this. This is not what I want. Well, I told you that that post was about a year ago, correct? Yes. Let me go ahead and give you another update that just happened recently a year later. What is happening? Our OP has actually come back, but they came back on a relationship advice thread for our next story. My male 32 fiance, female 32, suddenly doesn't want to marry me anymore because of a disagreement we had a year ago. What now? Hi, everyone. Hi again. I've been with my fiance Lola for almost seven years now, and we've been engaged for two of those. We have twins together, male and female, three, and I thought we were happy. About a year ago, we had a small fight slash disagreement about how she was raising our kids, but after receiving some feedback from Reddit, I was able to see that I was in the wrong and I was being incredibly offensive toward my wife. This was on a different account that I lost the info for, but everyone was very helpful, so thanks again. I apologized, and she seemed to accept my apology, and I thought things were back to normal after all of that. She seemed to be her normal self again, and we didn't argue slash disagree about that topic anymore. In fact, we hadn't even had a minor disagreement for months after that. I thought we were happy. Well, we were originally planning to get married last year, October of 2023, 
but she ended up changing her mind and saying she wanted to push back the wedding a bit. I was a bit confused, and she wouldn't really elaborate on why. She just said it was stressful to plan a wedding with toddlers and she needed some time, so I agreed. Well, she just dropped a bomb on me out of nowhere a few days ago when she randomly stated that she doesn't think she wants to get married anymore. This was heartbreaking to hear, of course, and I asked that we sit and talk it out. She ended up telling me that she doesn't think we are compatible after seven years and that she thinks we should go our own ways and co-parent. I'm devastated. I pressed for more information, like what made you realize this and why now? And she basically said that she felt like I didn't really know her and that I didn't want to know her. I thought this was ridiculous. I know everything about her. I know her favorite color, movie, and song. I know her favorite food. I can read her body language extremely well. I do know her. We've been together for years. She said a few more things, and apparently she's been thinking over our relationship since that fight happened a year ago. She said it was eye-opening for her, and that when I let her see the post and she looked through all the comments, she realized things about me that she had swept under the rug for years and blown off as a one-time issue. She went on a whole spiel about all these things she had realized about me and how she didn't think we should be together anymore. I don't even know what she means. I think I zoned out for most of her rant because I was so blindsided and hurt by this that I was trying not to break down in tears. I offered to go to couples counseling and individual counseling, but she said it was too late and that I should have done that slash offered that a year ago when this all blew up. I don't even know what to do now, and I think it's a bit unfair for her to put all that on me. Just because I didn't think of therapy after a minor disagreement a year ago, I'm no longer someone she wants to marry? That's insane. I don't know what to do. How can I get her to give me another chance to see that I still love her and we can make this work? What can I say to make her change her mind? I'm so lost and I don't know what to do. Edit. I think it might be a good idea to link the original post with the details of our disagreement, as some people are asking for details and accusing me of avoiding the question, so the post can be found here. What a sad turn of events. First, we have the main story that happened, and you can see where things kind of got off the rail. Then the wife, I guess, through this, is able to see things that she's pushed aside or swept under the rug that she's dealt with throughout their relationship because now they're at seven years. And then at the end of that first post, we see that our OP is seeing some of his issues. And at that point, he is correct. I'm shocked that they didn't get themselves into couples counseling after that whole ordeal. You can see the big gap of communication that they have. His wife is willing to look past a lot of the things that upsets her about him. And that's like the first step to a divorce is when you're willing to push aside and keep pushing aside and things accumulate over time. And then you get the big R word, resentment. And once that creeps into your relationship, it takes a lot of work to start fixing that if you can. I'm sure there's some other things we don't know about because to have been in there for seven years on the cusp of the wedding, her putting a hold on that. That's a huge thing for any woman to do. And you said a couple things in your newest update that were kind of leading us into why the problem is already happening between you two, her spiel. And I understand in the moment that, you know, hey, you're telling me that you're just trying to hold it together. But when people are trying to explain to you what's going on, you then tuning them out is probably a bigger issue than you know, because you're not hearing what they're saying anymore. So it's compounded on you, unfortunately. At this point, my biggest piece of advice, get to a point where you can have the separation amicably. And that way you two can have a healthy co-parenting relationship going forward because it sounds like she's already made her mind up. Well, just to provide a bit of what commenters were questioning on because other commenters were asking, have you ever asked her about stories of her childhood? How her upbringing was? Have you asked her about special traditions? Is there any effort that you made during holidays for her when it comes to her family and participating in those 
traditions. Let me go ahead and read to you an answer from our OP regarding that. When we first began dating, I did notice that there were a few differences in the way we did things in holidays. The main thing I noticed was that she celebrated Christmas on Christmas Eve, which was different for me since I always celebrated on the 25th. I vaguely remember asking her why she did it on that day instead of the actual day, and she just told me, that's when we celebrate it. But I stupidly just thought she meant that her and her family chose to celebrate that day for some reason, and didn't really press it, since it worked out fine. We could be with her family when they celebrated, and with mine on the actual day. The Redditor responded back saying, So in seven years, the only thing you know about her cultural traditions is that they open presents on Christmas Eve, and your reaction was that it's convenient to you because you get to have your holiday on the actual day? Our OP responded and said, well, it sounds bad when you say it like that. A lot of people who don't try and think about the shoe being on the other foot, they can only see the shoe on their one foot. It's very difficult for them to understand and empathize with others. And I can definitely get where they're coming from. Just knowing the ins and outs of your partner's day and how they act, that's great. And it's good to be aware of those things. But backgrounds are important. Culturally, it's important to feel like you're including them and taking interest in some of their stuff. Every time we found out anything about Voices background, we've jumped full on into those type of traditions and stuff like that. Voice just cooked spatzel and schnitzel. Schnitzel. Yeah, we've gotten to experience cooking some of those things. It's very, some of it's difficult because we're learning like spatzel. That was a whole long thing, but we had a lot of fun and you know, we were wondering if it tastes right. <laughs> I find it funny. I think it's actually easier to make arepas than it is to make spatzel. But we've introduced some of those things. Voice found out some of the stuff from my cultural background and has made amazing plates from it. I think it's different when you're dealing in a relationship and you tell someone something important about you that you find special and their only response is, okay. And I can agree with that. I know that when you and I first got together, your big deal was you liked the way your mother had done holidays because she did it the day before. And it was only because, and I remember this because it made a lot of sense to me, if you do all the cooking and the preparing and all the stuff that you need to do the day before, then on the holiday, you can all just relax. Correct. And, you know, at first, maybe I might have found that a little weird just because of the way I grew up, but I embrace those things. We've always had the conversations, though. Let me just go to a last edit from ROP. They said... I feel that all of you have given me a lot to think about and reflect on. Thank you. I will no longer be replying to comments. Go get into counseling and then move on with your life. You can still be a great parent and a good friend to your ex-wife. Well, let's go on to our next story and see about this potential wedding and family issue. Am I the a-hole for not wanting my sister at my wedding since she is in a wheelchair and will take up all the spotlight? Why is this a post <laughs> <laughs> you, you're gonna see my sister 26 has been on and off out of the hospital i am going to call my sister anna anna got cancer when she was 15 and was able to beat it ever since she's been having growths and anytime one appears we are worried about the cancer coming back my issue is that she always makes these announcements that she needs to go to the doctors again at the worst times. At the beginning, I thought it was just bad timing, but it has happened so many times when I hit a milestone, my graduations, my birthdays, my engagement party. Anytime she makes an announcement, she needs to go back to the hospital. My whole family will flock to her. I have had my birthday dinner turn into my relatives flocking to her for the whole night. I had a dinner party to announce my wedding date for my relatives. It was going so great, and it was a fun time until Anna told mom she needs to go back to the hospital. Soon, everyone forgot about the reason for the dinner party, and it was quiet. My aunt even stepped in to do a prayer for Anna. Another event was taken over. I went low contact with her after that. She was invited to the wedding, and it was in two weeks. I learned today she is on and off in a wheelchair from my mom slash Anna. She will need to take it just in case for the wedding. I asked if the rest of the family was informed, and she told me no. I told both of them they need to inform them. They told me they don't want to worry them and won't do that. 
I had enough and told them you need to tell them before my wedding. Again, a no. I then informed them Anna is not invited. This started a huge argument about how I'm a dick, and my point is that I am sick of her stealing the spotlight. That what will happen if she rolls in with a wheelchair? Am I the a-hole? Initially, you hear it, and in my mind anyway, you go, well, I'm sorry that your sister has inconvenienced you with her health problems and what she's been fighting since she was 15, I believe. Correct. And she's 26 now. That's been a minute. That is the first thing that comes to my mind when I hear this. Now, the next thing that happens is she explains that at every single event, her sister takes that time to explain to everyone that she's having to go back because it wasn't just one. These are announcements that get made right in the middle of an event, something that's supposed to bring everyone together and be a joyous occasion. Of every single event. That's an issue. Yes, definitely tell your loved ones what you're going through, but... There is a time and place for every single thing in your life. In my mind, OP, I don't believe you would be the a-hole. It's only because I will always be on the side of the fence of it's your wedding. You're allowed to uninvite or invite anyone you want. That's specifically how I'm handling this one. Before you do it, though, all I want to ask is, have you had the conversations with your sister? Have you spoken to her about when she announces when she is going through stuff? If you haven't, You owe it to yourself and your sister's relationship to have that conversation with her. So the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is not the a-hole. And there are quite a few Redditors that came out. The first ones were saying what you were suggesting, Tim Stradamus. The OP should really sit down and talk with her family, set healthy boundaries, that something is not sitting quite right. They definitely need to be told. Additional Redditors came out with their experiences about how family members on their end had leveraged and manipulated the situation to use an illness in their favor just to gain attention. In fact, OP said that she used to love her sister, but has now actually grown to resent her sister. And in fact, more Redditors came out saying they've cut contact with these types of family members and their lives have never been better because of it. I think this is going to be a hard road if you have to put away, I guess you could say, the severity of the illness because our OP sister did deal with cancer, did overcome it. For the rest of her life, she'll always have to be looking over and maintaining that. Is it okay for someone to utilize that type of illness to sort of potentially gain attention? That's a very common occurrence. Is it? Unfortunately so. And many individuals were saying, hey, you need to go ahead and hit this out first. Inform family members because the next thing that she'll probably do is victimize herself because of your decision. So our OP came out and said this in an edit. I'm going to do a mass blast to all of my relatives saying she's in a wheelchair and unsure if she will be able to make it to my wedding. Keep my sister in their thoughts and prayers. I'm getting ahead of this. I guess because I don't come from experience on this type of topic, that it's very hard. Even I'm on the fence of, well, she does and is going through her battle with her illness. And you do have to give it some kindness and empathy and understanding. But when you have people that have said that their family members have used sicknesses to garner attention and manipulate a situation... I guess I have to just accept that that's just what people do. (laughs) And that sucks. I'm sorry that that's happened to people. I think it's difficult because you want to empathize with anyone that is encountering difficulties in their life. And I come back to there is a time and a place. I know that to get biopsies on potential cancerous growth, those take a while. You have to sit, you have to get the biopsy, you have to wait for the lab results to come back, and then you get told. It's not an over-the-night thing. And the moment that you're suspicious, I don't know why our OP sister would use an event to sort of, and this is where I come back to, to sort of garner the attention. Because I don't think you would have noticed it when you're sitting in a chair at dinner than you would when you're at home and just after you're done taking a shower and you see it on your body. The thing is, if something worried me and I was in the middle of an event, 
My first thought is once this event is over, I'm going to go ahead and do the phone calls. I'm going to go and get this done and checked sure. out. I wouldn't do it in the middle of that event. Don't invite the trouble. And this is where I go back and forth. What do I think is acceptable for me to do? And is that an okay thing that I see it as a sort of standard for how other people should also act as well? That's difficult because I know in that situation, I would definitely not take anyone's, especially when you understand from the frame of the event that's happening, when you understand that it is not about you, you make sure to not draw any attention that could be negative or impactful on the event. Well, let's go on to our next story and see what you think about this family situation. Am I the a-hole for disowning my son and refusing to invite him to my wedding or interact with him in any way? When I was 15, I became pregnant with my son. My parents were deeply ashamed, and I felt like I ruined my life. Before that, I was a bright student. I was determined to be the best mother I could be to my son. As a single mother, I didn't risk dating until my son was an adult. I wanted him to grow up to be a mature, consentious adult. I doted on him. He came out to me when he was 17. I promised that I would love him forever. When he was 20, I met a man and fell in love. I was happy and my son approved of him almost immediately. I found out three years later that my boyfriend and son were having an affair behind my back. I was horrified at how my son could betray me so deeply. He apologized, but said it was true love and that they didn't mean to hurt me. I cut him out and my now ex-boyfriend out of my life. I don't like to talk about that part of my life. For all intents and purposes, I do not have a son. It's humiliating and unbearable. I met another man. He has been incredible and supportive. I realized that I did not know what real love was until I met him. He and I married in a beautiful ceremony this past autumn. My son has been trying to contact me. He is still with my ex. I have blocked him out of my life. Some of my friends who have known me and my son for decades have begged me to get back in touch. Apparently his life is falling apart and he misses me. They said he was young when he made the mistake. I refused. Am I the a-hole? Holy douche canoe, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> this store is wild. So can I ask this? How old was the son when he got into the relationship with his mother's ex? I'm so glad that you asked that. Our OP actually responded to a commenter saying they had been flirting for a while from what I've gathered, but it likely only became physical when my son was 22 slash 23, a few months before I found out. So he was 22, 23. How old is the boyfriend at that point? I would have to say he's probably around OP's age. And that would put her in like She 40s? had OP when she was 15. So that would be, what, 37? Yes. If she had him at 15, yes. And he's 22, 23, it would be 37. Okay. So that's not great. I only asked those questions because she said her friends were basically arguing on the son's behalf because of his age and when the relationship got kicked in. Correct. And now apparently his life is in shambles and he misses her. Okay. Well, that's super. But maybe don't cheat with your mother's boyfriend. That's a good start, especially when you're talking about family relations. That should have been an unspoken thing, period. I am sorry for her OP that her life events turned into that. All she's asking here is, is she the a-hole for not inviting her son to her wedding? Correct. Or interacting with him in any way. No. You had him at 15? Whew. From what it sounds like is you were a good mother and he repaid you by sleeping with your then boyfriend. And it was true love is what the son said. Correct. Well, if you would like to know a little bit more information about him, one of the questions asked was, was that type of selfishness slash recklessness abandoned typical for him and in your relationship with him? Our OP responded saying, kind of. He was spoiled sweet. I worked hard to give him a good life. He was a scholarship kid in his school district, so I had to work extra to pay for nicer things so he didn't feel ostracized. His teachers said he was a joy to be around. 
He had friends in theater who adored him. That's not to say I let him get away with everything. In middle school, I found out he and a few friends were bullying an unpopular girl. I made him apologize to her and work to replace the stuff he and his buddies messed up. The school wanted it to be swept under the rug, but as a mother I could not stand by and let that poor girl get bullied. My son cried and apologized. He wanted to fit in socially with the jock, likely straight boys, and went along with it. He really shaped up in high school. He got into his dream college and I was so proud of him. It's such an unfortunate road. OP, you're not the a-hole. Well, let me go ahead and add some additional details before I give you the consensus on Reddit. Our OP says, I don't want to speak to him or ever see his face again. The only thing I talked about was if he was being coerced or made to do this, because I truly could not believe my own son would hurt me like this. Everything pointed to the fact he wanted who he wanted, and he didn't care to think about me and how he was betraying me. Other commenters were curious about how our OP is now. Our OP says, I am at peace now, surprisingly. I am in college and have a 4.0 GPA. My husband and I are newlyweds, and it's blissful. I had a wonderful honeymoon. I have more time now. My friends are still here for me, even though some want me to reconcile. Our consensus on Reddit over this whole thing was not the a-hole. In fact, the whole feel from the commenters is, what in the Jerry Springer is all of this? Is that still fetch? <laughs> fetch. Now, I will say, there are a lot of people that say cheating, especially when it comes to family members. That's unfortunately a thing that happens. Shocking. I would never want this on anyone. If you going no contact with him is what you need to stay mentally healthy and happy, do it. That way, neither of you can hurt each other. Well, I know we've got into a mix of family matters, but this month they're just really interesting. So let's go into our next one. Am I the a-hole for attempting to defend my family after a moment of weakness? My best friend and her brother speak English, French, and Arabic. I think it's pretty cool because I only speak English and I have no problem with it at all. I do feel a little insecure when I go to her house and her entire family speaks in Arabic and I have no clue as to what they're saying. It also sounds like they're making fun of me, but I know that's just me being a little crazy. Anyways, I invited them to my house for Christmas after I told my parents they don't celebrate, and they insisted I invite them and most of my family members like them or didn't really care for them. I do have a few relatives that are more narrow-minded, but they didn't seem to have an issue with them either until my best friend and her brother started speaking in Arabic. My aunt yelled at them, doing the whole, we speak English in America rant, while two uncles started to accuse them of discussing terrible things. I admit, this was bad. My dad told our relatives to shut up or get out, which pissed off my aunt, and then they started to fight, and long story short, Christmas was ruined and everyone left. My parents reassured my friends, and I did as well. But while we were waiting for their parents to pick them up, my best friend's brother said my relatives are the worst white people they've ever met, and I responded with, well, you can't blame them for being wary about someone speaking in a foreign language that they can't understand. I didn't mean to excuse my relatives, but I also didn't like how he just automatically made it seem like my entire family is so bad and the worst. Yes, they reacted badly, but my aunt and the two uncles are actually super nice and aren't bad people at all. It was a moment of weakness slash ignorance, you could say. He said something in Arabic to my friend. I'm 99% sure it was directed at me. And when I asked him what he said, he sarcastically asked if he scared me, which isn't what I meant. My best friend didn't say a word, but she hasn't talked to me since and is clearly avoiding me. Her brother also makes it a point to speak in Arabic when he sees me and is making his white friends yell Arabic words when they're around me as well. I do think he's overdoing it and isn't helping his case at all, but I'm afraid what I said might have crossed into bigoted slash racist territory. My friend once told me intent makes all the difference when it comes to racism slash ignorance, 
And I didn't have any bad intentions. I was just trying to help them understand where my relatives were coming from, but she just seems to dislike me now. Am I the a-hole? Me, my best friend, and her brother are all 17. They were also born and raised here, but their parents don't speak English. So this one's a very nuanced and very layered topic because I'm certain there's a good amount of people who have walked through this. We have a situation where ROP invites her Arabic friends over to her house for the holidays. For Christmas. And I guess at a point in time, her friends are exchanging in their language something. I'm not sure what they said, but it was to the effect that when they did it, people at the table, her aunts and uncles. Correct. It sounds like one aunt and two uncles. Said some pretty racist things. I think for me, this story is uh, everyone sucks because unfortunately, you being 17, I can kind of see it where you're defending your family because it's you kind of get on that fence of, well, you don't know who they actually are. They're good people. You don't know them like that. Don't say those things, right? This is how I'm thinking she's looking at that situation when her friends bring it up. Between that and her potentially saying that it felt as if her friends were talking about her entire family and not just these specific few. They're 17. I can understand having a in the moment defense of a family member. But by you defending them, you're defending everything they just said at the table. That's where your friends saw it. Now, what the brother is doing by it sounds like bullying you is disgusting. But I hope that people have been able to give you some perspective on it because this definitely is nuanced. I can get where she's just trying to think she's defending her family, but you're defending their words and their values by doing what you did. So that's why I say, I I think everyone sucks, maybe more so the OP, but the way they're handling it doesn't make it any better. Well, the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is the a-hole. I don't agree with strictly just that viewpoint. I agree with yours, Tim Stradamus. Everyone sucks here, but I'll add some more nuance to the reason why I think everyone sucks here. First and foremost, I do agree with the outcome that our OP is the a-hole for defending adults and their mistakes, because that's what our OP did. She's a child. She just defended adults that did a very awful thing. I understand that she tried to defend family, but there's a time and a place for that, and that clearly was not it, regardless of how your friends were talking. The only people in this entire party that I think was not the a-hole were her parents. I think they did a stand-up thing. They made the aunt and the two uncles leave because of their bigoted views, and they clarified with their two guests that they didn't do anything wrong. I sort of don't agree with that, though. I'm bilingual. I speak Spanish. There is etiquette in how you speak. And if you know that you're in a place where it's predominantly one language or the other, and you know how to speak all the languages, then you should keep that etiquette. You are in someone else's house. Everyone is simply English speaking there. And suddenly you are talking in another language with someone else. It would also be included if they had guests come over to their home and then suddenly two people started talking in another language nobody else could understand. Whether it's English speaking, Arabic, French, Spanish, whatever it is, there is a time and a place. And a lot of people pointed that out. That's one reason why I don't give them a pass, at least for the friends. The other one is exactly as you said, Tim Stradamus, it's bullying tactics. I understand if you don't want to be friends with someone because they no longer meet your values. It is disgusting that they would try and loop in their friends to antagonize an entire issue that doesn't need to happen over an incident that she didn't have anything to do with exactly it's very sad yeah hopefully she learns from the the situation and doesn't let this corrupt how she feels about other cultures going forward in her life because it'd be very sad if she takes this and pushes it forward like some people do unfortunately i definitely agree with that Well, let's go on to our next story and see what we think about this father-daughter relationship. Am I the a-hole for telling my daughter about the real reason for my divorce with her mother? I left my ex-wife after 10 years of dead bedroom. 
I left as soon as my youngest was 18, and I didn't hide my happiness while doing it. I threw a ditch the bitch party, and I wake up every day since then with a smile on my face. My kids were not thrilled at this and stopped talking to me. I decided not to make amends with them or share my side of the story because I have done my part. I was there till they went to college. If they need me, all they have to do is ask. But I am 46 and I plan to fill my life with as much joy and happiness as I can. I just don't have enough time left to try to convince my kids to not hate me. I asked for divorce one year ago and two days later I met a woman online. My plan was to remain casual. That didn't pan out as I planned because this woman became my girlfriend pretty fast. Apparently, my ex has been feeding lies to my kids' minds that I left her for my girlfriend and I was already cheating on her. My daughter, who is the oldest, started messaging my girlfriend on Instagram, saying bad things to her, how she is a home wrecker. I asked my daughter to meet me and talk to me directly instead of harassing my girlfriend. I bought her dinner and told her that I never cheated on her mother, which honestly I regret. I should have cheated on her. I wasted my time suffering. I told her about dead bedroom and how she didn't put effort in our relationship. She is 22, so I think she can handle it. She asked me why didn't I leave her mother before, and I told her that I had this notion that I should write it out until kids are 18. I thought that was the right thing to do, but I am not sure anymore. What I do know is that I don't want to think about it. I want to look forward to my future, and if she wants to hate me, she's free to do so. I seriously do not have any plans to convince her otherwise. I want to spend the rest of my life with people who want to be with me. I really don't have any plans to convince others to be with me, even if they are my own kids. So she wants to spend time with me. My doors are always open for her and her brother, but she can't harass the woman who makes me happy. If she has so much problem with her, then it's best that we keep our distance. My daughter asked me to give her proof that I only started dating my girlfriend after the separation, and I showed her my messages. It took her about a month to process it, but she eventually apologized to my girlfriend and we spent time together on New Year's Eve. As my daughter got to know my girlfriend, she understood how cool she is. They are bonding very well. My ex raged when she learned that my daughter spent time with my girlfriend. My daughter told her about what I said and told her that she does not blame me anymore and wants to move on. Now my ex is up my ass sending me nasty messages about how I shouldn't have told our daughter about our sex life, how disgusting, etc., etc. Am I the a-hole? So I guess we'll start with this. It sounds like the OP kind of shut the door on his kids because he says it at the start that it's a take it or leave it kind of situation, I believe. And I don't like that. I commend you and I have a head slap moment <laughs> because I commend you for telling your daughter the truth. Because it wasn't just what was happening in the bedroom. He says it. She wasn't trying. Period. That's an issue in a relationship. I'm not even talking about the bedroom stuff. When he says she wasn't trying, I'm assuming it was in other aspects as well. But the head slapper for me, though, is the fact that he waited this long. Stop believing that you need to stay in a relationship because of the kids. You can still be a great parent and give them what they need, but not do it at the expense of your mental health and who you are. He gave it to his daughter, honestly, and it was only because, okay, this situation only happens because the ex-wife starts speaking poison into their kid's ears about the entire ordeal. He wouldn't have even been in this situation had she not started that. Now, I get all the things that he said about how he was describing the relationship and the ending of it and the party he threw. Those words are definitely coming unmeasured, or if they are, it just shows how callous rop is towards his family and moving on with his life but yeah in my opinion you are and you are not the a-hole the consensus on reddit is a mix it's between you're the a-hole not the a-hole and everyone sex here let me go ahead and break that down so the you're the a-hole people just felt weird about the whole post in essence they felt as if he was bragging about the ditch the bitch thing and 
that he almost had an entitled attitude. Some said that he's sort of the a-hole here because he should have left sooner if it was this bad. Others were saying not the a-hole, that no one should be forced to stay with someone that they don't love. And if it makes them happy to not be in that relationship, go for it. You've you found a way past it and you're able to rebuild your relationship. And the everyone sucks here was a mix of those two rationales. I would have to stem as everyone sucks here, but let me go ahead and break down my reasons for it. First, oh man, this ex, she's an awful nasty person. To twist the relationship of a child and a parent, it doesn't matter how old they are, is pretty awful. And if she was doing that in this situation, I can just imagine what OP went through throughout their toxic relationship. But I still don't like how OP talks about his relationships as if he's writing off his kids. I'm looking to be happy. And if my kids no longer want those kind of things for me, then I can just move past them. I only want to fill my life with people that will make me happy. It sort of feels as if he never really wanted to work to have a relationship with his kid. He wanted to work to clear up the misunderstanding that there was ever an affair. It makes it feel calloused. In my mind, it's almost as if, do you truly love your kids? Or was this a passing moment where you were waiting till they were 18 and then you could just write it away? They're adults. And yeah, you'll be there, but if they don't want you in their lives, and that's fine too. I don't care. I I think for me, it just stems, and this is why I just had to put the everyone sex here. No, I do not agree that anybody stay in a relationship that is not healthy for them. A hundred percent. I mean, don't get me wrong. It will probably be one of the toughest things you'll have to do because when you emotionally invest in someone... It tends to be a lot. You, It's not just emotions. It's finances. It's, it's a life routine. It's not easy to say, hey, I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. Well, let's go ahead and head over into our next story and see what's happening in this relationship and potential shifting of priorities. Am I the a-hole for telling my boyfriend that I do not want his kids ever over chores? Original post. I, female 27, have been with my boyfriend, male 25, for four years. We do not support each other financially and split costs 50-50. We often talk about getting married. We're very in love and he is 99% the most perfect man in every single way. He is my partner for life the way I see it. We also talk sometimes about having kids. Even though I never wanted them before, he and I were together, and he knew that. In the first year of our relationship, I realized I wanted to give a child the chance to be loved by this man, and I know he would be an amazing father, so I told him I had changed my mind, though I don't plan to have a child until I'm 35. Now the issue. Boyfriend is in a management position at work. He is, however, miserable and has planned on quitting for months. We recently returned from two weeks abroad. We've been home for one month. I work seasonally, so I have not had to work much for the last month, while he goes to work five days a week for a job he hates. I am aware that boyfriend needs more support right now, so since he has been home, I have been the meal planner, the grocer, the chef, the dish doer, the laundry maid, the litter box chief, everything. He comes home at four and promptly checks out to play video games. The first few days, I would kiss him and ask if what I had planned for dinner sounded good. He would thank me for my help and tell me he was sorry for being so lazy. I would tell him that I understand work has put him in survival mode and I can help out. It has been one month that I have done every single home task. There are days when he wouldn't have eaten a meal or had clean clothes to wear without me doing it for him. Yesterday, he finally put in his two weeks notice at work. I wanted to celebrate by making dinner and picking up dessert. Both the butcher shop and the pastier were closed. I was disappointed and drove to my grocery to try to come up with a new plan. Somehow along the drive, I completely went numb. 
started to disassociate and then realized that I was crying and sweating and getting nauseous. I think I was having a panic attack. I drove myself home and got in the shower where I had a complete breakdown and started yelling to myself about how backwards it was that this man who doesn't pay my bills lets me do everything for him. I realized that even with working my own job full time, dealing with sexual assault trauma and a two year long police investigation that has come about because of the abuse, I have never ever stopped taking care of myself or the house chores. If anything, I did more chores to deal with my mental state at that time. I have never left him in the gutter for weeks at a time, not contributing to our home. Halfway through my rant, my boyfriend came home. He heard me yelling and came to talk to me. He got in the shower with me and hugged me and asked me to tell him what was wrong, so I did. I didn't hold back. I told him I wasn't his maid. He gets paid to go to work, and that's his money. I got nothing for being the sole caretaker of the home. I told him I got a good glimpse of what life as a stay-at-home mom would look like. We also foster kittens, so I was also doing that alone, and that I was not going to do it. I told him that I knew I didn't want to have his future kids anymore because his life wouldn't change and my whole identity would become maid, cook, and milkmaid. I told him I wasn't going to waste my life taking care of kids who can't do anything for themselves when he and I could travel forever, save money forever, and become the people we want to be. I told him I'd rather do anything else in the world than be a mother. I told him I loved him and I understand he's having a hard time, but asked him when I've ever put him in the position to do everything himself. He couldn't, because I never have. I told him I wanted to just be us forever, and that I felt relieved having told him that I don't want kids. He was very sad. He told me he had always looked forward to being a dad. I asked him if you could carry it, would you? He said, I don't know. I said, that means no, you wouldn't. So of course you want to be a dad. All you'd have to do would be to come inside me and you'd be a dad. I told him point blank at least four times, I do not want to be a mom, I want to be selfish, I don't want to be a maid. I know what people will say, has this been an issue before, him not doing chores? The answer is yes. At least three times a year we have this fight about the housework being uneven, but this was the last straw for me. I meant what I said, I love him. If I have to take care of him sometimes, and I know that going in, whatever, but to add tiny people to that and imagine it going the way things go now, I told him I would rather die than spend a month alone in a house taking care of it for some kids who don't contribute anything to my life. He's been sad since. Am I the a-hole? My heart hurts. So let's get into this powder keg of, I guess we can say expectations and I don't know really how to put this because it sounds like our OP is lost and doesn't really have a good beat on what she is looking for in life. And I can't blame someone who is, I think our participants in this story are 26 and 24, 27 and 25. Oh, I was close. <laughs> Just one year off for both of them. They're still fairly young. So they're, they're growing into their relationship. They're trying to figure out what it is they want in life. I don't blame them for the crossroads that they've met at because ROP states it. When she got into a relationship, she definitely wanted nothing to do with children. And then through the course of their relationship now, she's gotten to be with her boyfriend and she says that she wants to give him the chance to be a father. All right, she comes around to it, but that doesn't mean that you still want to be a mother. That just means you want to give your husband what he wants or sorry, your boyfriend what he wants. So she was trying to change her wants and values for her partner. But when you're talking about having a child, that can't be one of the things you do. You either do want kids or you don't. And you have to be very honest with yourself and your partner about that. But she does try to change it for him. And now we're seeing the consequences of that. Because throughout her relationship now, she says about three times on average a year, for four years now, they've had big explosive arguments over him not doing chores. Or at least not making it to where it's even for each other. Chore distribution is important. <laughs> it's it's really important for your mental health. And 
not feeling like the entire load is on you. And I'm not even talking about financially. We'll split that because that's a whole other conversation. I'm specifically only talking about chores because there's a lot to do to maintain a living space, especially when you're talking about, I've never heard this term before, um, cat box chief. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> we share in pretty much all our chores together. We try to pick up the other half and I can't expect for people who have only been in a relationship for four years and are that young to really grasp how important that is. But if I had a bit of advice, we've told this to our son, no matter what you do in life, there has to be balance. And when you do have your partner, when you are cohabiting with someone, you need to make sure that you're understanding and breaking things down to where they're equal, no matter what aspect of life you're in. And I've never understood when one partner is doing all of the tasks while the other one is sitting down or meandering or doing whatever they're doing that isn't helping. Because my feel has always been, well, if I can help you tackle what you're doing, we can get done with whatever it is that needs to be done. And then we can go have our fun together. It blows my mind when couples do that to each other because you can hear the microtransaction of anger building up. Every little thing equates to something pretty big at the end where we're seeing it, where she's having to do all of these tasks. And finally, she has a full breakdown. We have this coming to truth for her where she tells her boyfriend, I don't want kids. To let things get to that boil point shows your lack of communication skills. Please go get into some type of counseling if you're going to continue this relationship. By the way, not just for each other. You, OP, need to go get some counseling because you've had some stuff happen to you. And I don't know if you sought help yet. I'm not sure if she verifies that for us. No. Definitely, please go get the help you need. I think I'm going to have to say that everyone sucks because I know in the middle of her relationship, she wants to give her boyfriend, when things are on the up, a child. But that's against her values. We see it now. And then her boyfriend, if you know as her partner that she does not want kids and that she'll come around to it in time, you're wrong. You're forcing someone to fit into the box that you want to be in, but she doesn't want to be there with you. That's dangerous. The resentment, you can't climb out from that. But he's also the a-hole because not taking on the chores and simply letting someone in your life go, I got you. When someone says they got you, it does not mean every single chore for the rest of your guys' life together is going to be done by your significant other. Please, for everyone listening, equal chore distribution is important. I'm not saying 50-50. What I am saying is where it works for the both of you, and you, but you have to talk about those things. It needs to be a contribution of both sides. Yes. So in my opinion, both you guys suck because you're doing it to each other. Go get the help you need. So the consensus on Reddit was actually pretty mixed here. It ranged between you're the a-hole, not the a-hole, and no a-holes here. So the you're the a-hole individuals were saying, hey, how you essentially yelled and belittled your boyfriend is not the best way to get your message across to them. The not the a-holes were saying you can have your feelings, but there's got to be a better way to express them. Both sides were saying that they definitely need therapy, if not couples therapy. And for me, I have to also agree kind of side with the no a-holes here simply because it just feels like a relationship going through its growing pains. They need to be able to work this out and in a healthy way. And I definitely agree. Therapy is definitely needs to be on that list. If not as a couple's therapy, then just as individual therapy, because it really was a little worrisome to hear that there's sexual trauma there and it doesn't feel like that has truly been resolved. And instead, she has been, by doing these tasks around the house, just to essentially forget about it. Now, let me actually go ahead and provide us an update from our OP. Our OP says, do I show my boyfriend this post or does that make it worse? Damn, y'all tore us apart. Really went for my intelligence. Many perspectives shared, mostly that I am patient zero for mental illness and that my boyfriend and I should run away from each other or to therapy. I'll take therapy, as he has his own PTSD that's undiagnosed, and y'all help me see that for real. Thanks for all the real life advice. I love this man. He says he loves me and I believe him. You all cured me of being one of those people who go straight to break up. I see now, though, how wrong the uneven household work is, though. I see it's a problem. But when you see 700 people 
telling you to leave him or he will switch out your birth control and lock you in a cage, but that you would definitely be a terrible mother, it makes you ask yourself what you believe. And I'm going to keep asking myself, but I know he's my man. Thank you all. To clarify our finances very clearly once again, my boyfriend does not pay any of my bills. I started our relationship working 60-hour work weeks outdoors, nine months of the year. I still did the majority housework and cleaning then. I live off of savings and travel in December because I make that much money nine months of the year. I also started my own business this year, so I took my seasonal hours down to 40, but with my startup, I still average 50 hours a week. My boyfriend does not pay any of my bills. Hopefully, this clarifies that I am not, in fact, a lazy fuck. <laughs> Edit 2. Forgive me for only sharing the worst parts of myself and my boyfriend on the internet. No one wants to upvote on all endless tales of wonderful days of our lives, so geez. In reality, the conversation ended with me asking him if he could be okay with that. He said that he wanted to be with me no matter what, and that we had cats, we didn't need kids, and we had Asia to see all of. I want to believe him, but I am afraid of what everyone warns of, the eventual resentment of me. I promise we're not as fucked as I made us sound. Thanks for all the humbling reality checks, though. Well, I'm happy that our OP got some much-needed advice. Oh, hands down. I think Reddit can be one of the worst and best places to get advice from. Well, we saw the perspective from the girlfriend's point of view. Let's go ahead and go into this next story and see it from the husband's point of view. Am I the a-hole? My roommate, wife, is begging me not to divorce. Odd title, I know. I, 31 male, and my wife, 35 female, have been married for four years, together for eight we were never huge on sex, but we had it quite regularly until six months ago. There has been zero intimacy except a few awkward stiff kisses I initiate. Tell-tell signs of cheating, right? Thing is, I don't care. Over the last six months, I've fallen out of love with her either way, and it's obvious to myself and my family slash friends that she has fallen out of love with me. Here's the thing I don't understand, though. I want an amicable divorce. She's relatively reliant on me. We both work, but her family is far away. We live in the UK and both earn similar. I told her we're basically two friends slash roommates in a marriage. And I won't kick her out. I'm the leaseholder. It won't be hard for me to live with her. And I can't see how it'd be hard for her to live with me either. We'd just be carrying on as we are now, except not married or in a committed relationship. She's begging me not to divorce her and won't give me a straight answer as to why she doesn't want to. She just tells me she loves me and has tried several times to initiate sex and has small bouts of crying fits. Am I the a-hole? Move over, Newt. It's time to scoot. Wee. <laughs> <laughs> so all he's telling me is that there's been a six-month stretch because he's done a lot of assuming here. Yeah, I guess you can look up what the signs are for someone cheating. But unless you know for sure, you assuming that kind of stuff is very harmful. Let me go ahead and include an edit since you've brought that up. Edit. The cheating stuff was just a small suggestion and a small dig at how Reddit always has those signs before cheating. I'm not convinced she is or isn't. I don't know. Haven't accused her. Sorry for the confusion. The roommate thing is practically a mutual joke at this point. And yes, we were still friendly and spoke constantly during the six months. No, relationships aren't just sex, but there's only so many times you can have your wife pull away from a kiss and brush off a hug until you feel like shit, especially when it becomes impossible to talk about it as she walks off or ignores you when you mention it. So how long have they been in the relationship? Eight years. Eight years. Four years married. So he's saying that all of a sudden out of eight years, the last six months of their relationship have been cold. Correct. But up until then, everything was fine. Yes. How old are they? 31 and 35. Okay. Normally you see a lot of the intimacy levels go up and down starting in your 30s. Work, stress, diet, all of the things that come in with life. 
hormonal changes. There's so much to deal with. It's not just as easy as saying, well, I'm not attracted to my partner anymore. There could be many different reasons as to why it's happening. That's pretty interesting that you could about face like that in an eight year relationship that all of a sudden you just go, "Ah, I don't love you anymore. Now I get it. The cold shoulder and not being open to having the conversation sucks, but I don't know where your wife's head is with this situation because you don't really explain it all that well. All you told me is you suspected her of cheating and that she's pulling away from you when you're trying to be intimate. What happened six months ago? I'm sure people have had to have asked, like, what's this big change in their relationship that's happened all of a sudden? So in my opinion, OP, I think I'm going to have to go with you're not the a-hole. You don't owe anyone a relationship. I do find it weird that after eight years, though, and you're having a six-month bump, that you're willing to throw the relationship away. And you're not really explaining to me what happened within the last six months that has changed how she treats you. So maybe we're only getting it from your side, but maybe you've done something heinous. I don't know. But as of right now, what I believe is you're not the a-hole. The consensus on Reddit is also not the a-hole. Individuals were saying, if you no longer feel as if you're in love and you're, sounds like you're very set on what it is that you you think you need to do, go ahead and do it. You're not the a-hole for that. May I ask one thing, though? Yes. That I forgot to ask. Do they have children? They don't. Okay. The plot thickens. Let me go ahead and give you an edit. So in this edit, they go... I'm home at 6 p.m., 4.40 p.m. now, and I'll try to get her to open up. For those wondering, the last six months have been hectic at work. I have spoken about the lack of intimacy, and she's teased me a few times. Stuff like, we're like friends with benefits without the benefits. But if I don't laugh it up as a joke and try to actually broach the topic, she either ignores me or leaves to play on her computer. That being said... I'll hold off on the divorce stuff. Some of the more ball-kicking comments have made me realize I'm not fighting for the marriage, but she keeps shutting down and is an anti-therapy kind of person, but I'll suggest it. Honestly, got no clue how available therapy is in the UK. Guess I'll find out. I can just hope that it can be reached readily over there. I can imagine there's options. But it is still weird that he wouldn't go to that first over just throwing away an eight-year relationship. That is very odd. So let me go ahead and give you our final edit from our OP. I had a talk with her. My dad came to mediate and it didn't take long for her to give me the truth. She wants a baby and we figured we'd be child free. So I got a vasectomy just before the pandemic. She said intimacy just reminded her that I had the snip and made her depressed slash anxious. She and dad says it's reversible Her best friend came over and they showed me their chat history on Discord and texts. And yes, she's been baby mad for much longer than six months, but was scared to tell me. We have a good support system here and her parents and sisters visit often. So we're going to have therapy, assuming we can find it, and I'll look into a reverse vasectomy. For what it's worth, I'm not checked out on the marriage or flippant, and I will not put a kid through what I went through growing up, something I told my dad straight. Yes, I resent him a little still for leaving, and he was a big reason I got the snip, and hearing that made him cry. My wife is over the moon right now, and actually crying with joy that her fears of me refusing to try for a baby were false. I know her well despite what you might think. And she's incapable of manipulating people. Even her crying over the last few days was not like her, so I knew she was genuine. Little more info, she worked in an office pre-COVID, and the office was scrapped when lockdown happened, as it wasn't necessary. Small graphic design slash advertisement firm. So it was rocky work from home for a while, but in the end of 2022, it was clear the job was stable, and with the nature of her work, She's free to do whatever at home and takes breaks exactly when she needs to, which led her to wanting us to have a baby together, but she figured it wasn't possible. Intimacy went cold when she couldn't bear the fact I was snipped. The reason she brushed off my attempts to talk about the dry marriage was because she couldn't tell me the truth, her words, and it makes sense. She said she didn't want to lose me over it, and the divorce was the wake-up call she needed. Thanks for all the replies and DMs, and honestly, 
even with all the not the a-hole posts, I still felt like a prick since I brought up the divorce. I just put the blinkers on and move forward when I'm stressed, so I'd given up. Now to pray my balls aren't broken for good. <laughs> she knows about the post, and I just want to say thank you, Jen, for being a better person than I am, and I love you. Final edit. The therapy comes long before a baby. Chill. <laughs> good. I hope that he also, too, wants a child and that he's not being forced into having a child. I'm certain that's probably come up. It's no different than the last story you told me where it seems like the having a baby is on one side and not the other. And that can be very relationship ending if you can't meet in the middle because you might be forcing someone into having children that doesn't want them. That's very true. Well, I do wish them the best. And let's go to our next story and see about a situation which offers it after the baby is born. Am I the a-hole for leaving after he said he wouldn't love my kid as much as his own? I had my son when I was young. I was 18, a senior in high school. I was nine months pregnant when I graduated. I still went to college online and I worked full time from home to support myself and my child. I had an apartment by the time I was 19. Now, when my son was two months old, I started dating a friend of mine. He quickly took on the role of dad, which was easy for him to do, considering there was no other father figure involved. The guy knows he has a kid, but told the judge he didn't want to meet him, and so he just pays child support. We are now 22, and things have been great. We were actually supposed to get married in December. He had such a good relationship with my son, and honestly, I'm pretty sure my son favored dad over me. But I gave birth to our daughter last month. She was planned. I never thought for a minute he would treat my son differently because he's always been dad. He wanted to be called dad, so he pushed for it. When I was in the hospital after giving birth, he and his parents were hovering over my son and kept telling him to not touch the baby like that and just kept repeating saying stop or don't touch the baby whenever my son tried holding his sister. And since bringing her home, he's been acting weird. He doesn't want me doing basically anything. He picks out all the outfits. He does every feeding. He changes all her diapers. Every time I try to step in, I'm met with a no, I'm going to do it. He has let my son do one feeding. And even then he was being a helicopter parent about it and telling him he's doing it wrong and ended up taking the bottle and doing it himself. He even took my daughter to his mom's for a week and gave me no say in it. So I talked to him about it and said he was royally fucking with my mental state because he's refusing to let me or my son bond with the baby. And somehow this got on the topic of my son being pushed to the side. And he goes, I don't know how you can expect me to love him like he's my own when I have my own kid now. I'm still his dad, but it's not the same. I want to bond with my daughter. You had your turn, and now it's mine. And like, it was a slap in the face. I kicked him out. I started breastfeeding my daughter, which is something he wouldn't let me do before. But he made me pump because our daughter preferred breast milk. I started trying to bond with my daughter, but like, I just had to check myself into extensive therapy because he cut me and my son out so much that my daughter doesn't feel like my daughter at all. I'm disconnected. Like I'm a babysitter or something. Well, he's been begging to come back and I outright refuse. I hate him. I never thought I'd say that, but I absolutely fucking hate him. He says I'm being ridiculous over him just wanting to bond with his baby. And most women would love to have a dad step in like him. But all that aside, I can't get over what he said about not loving my son as much as his daughter. Because he raised my son as his own. So I told him that, and he's saying I took it out of context and blew it up. Edited to add, I really don't understand what you guys are on about with him apparently not treating me and my son different. He literally doesn't let us near my baby. I held my daughter a total of maybe five times since I gave birth because he refused to let me do anything, saying it was his turn and that I had my turn because I carried her for nine months. He doesn't do anything with my son now either at all. He also won't let my son near the baby because he's 
going to hurt her. When he allowed my son to feed my daughter that partial bottle, he was holding our daughter and holding my son's hand at the same time and not letting him do anything and then told him to go away because he was doing it wrong. He literally took my daughter out of this house for a week and I didn't even know until his mother was picking them up. And he told me to deal with it because it's his kid too and his family should be able to spend one-on-one with her. Like, how is that not him treating us differently? I'm not keeping him from his kid either. I don't know why y'all are jumping to that BS. He also quit his job to be a stay-at-home dad without even telling me. So no, I have an income. Never stopped working because I work from home and a place that's mine. Am I the a-hole? Another edited to add, Thank you, everyone. I think I'm going to log off for a while. I'm just really lost right now. I appreciate all of you. Man, it sounds like ROP was fielding a lot of assumptions. Sounds like it. So I guess we'll start with the facts because there are plenty, but we'll get into this one first. She has a son with a man that doesn't want to be a part of his life. He's paying child support, but he says he does not want anything to do with the kid. She moves on. She meets another person. And I guess they're boyfriend and girlfriend? Correct. Okay. And now she's just had another kid. This one planned. So before I get into anything else, how old is the boy? He's four years old. And he's only known OP's boyfriend as his father. Correct. Because the OP's boyfriend came into his life when he was two months old. That's been dad. And in my mind, that puts your boyfriend in a worse light than his actual biological father. Because at least with him, he cut the ties and he moved on. He didn't give his son an illusion that he was his father. You, however, have been in this child's life. He's now four. And now you're downgrading your love for him because you have a daughter now. Apparently the newest model came in. He's disgusting. And close your eyes and point at any sentence on that page. It's all alarming. I didn't hear anything good. He was two-faced, from what I understand. He was one way to you and your son before the child. And then after the birth, he's become an isolator and a manipulator. I'm shocked that none of this has ever reared its head at you. Because this is a complete change. That's so hard to believe that someone just flips a switch and goes, by the way, just deal with it. I'm taking our child to my mother's for a week who does that without consulting their partner op's boyfriend does Mm, that's not a partner that's a scary person is what that is if you think that's scary let me go ahead and read to you one of op's comments in the comment section they said we live about four hours from the reservation and they only go there once a year but yeah i've been freaking out about it because they've already used that threat she's a native baby remember that I have more rights than you do. I have it all in texts. Oh man, we're messing with a whole lot of other legalities. OP, I guess I'm certain you probably already got this advice. Get a lawyer because that sounds like you have an uphill fight. You are definitely not the a-hole OP. The consensus on Reddit is that our OP is not the a-hole. In fact, everyone was saying that this is freaking insane. For me, I would equate this to this being a true crime if you're not careful, because the way that OP's boyfriend sounds is completely unhinged. And a whole throng of Redditors said, please get a lawyer and make sure that you have custody in place. Could you imagine the isolation she's already gone through with her daughter to the point where it doesn't feel like it's her kid anymore? That's why those The first six months are extremely critical between a parent and the baby. I think that he knew what he's doing. I think his threats are very poignant and she better keep those texts. I think she's been blind to how bad the relationship is because if she was willing to let someone tell her not to breastfeed when she wanted to and not let her hold her baby only five times since it was born... Those type of demands didn't just all of a sudden start cropping up in your life and you're accepting them. She's already been preconditioned within this relationship to do what she's told. So I'm guessing maybe she looked past a lot of red flags because it didn't all of a sudden just become he's this bad guy that's taking her kid away. 
and isolating. This has already been there, is what it sounds like. I can definitely see that. And I think sometimes it's difficult to see the red flags. Well, I do wish the OP best in this one because this is a very scary situation. And one of the things that I'd like to point out is having a child is a very big thing. I can understand why it is that some parents are afraid to have them, whether for one reason or the other. I try to give us the perspective of the fear from a woman's point of view and then the uncertainty from a man's point of view. I think in this one, this is probably one of those worst case scenarios you can think about. Very startling to hear the details of this. Well, let's go to something a little different. Let's stem away from relationships. Whew, so much drama, right? Mm -hmm. And let's go into a school. So for our next story, am I the a-hole for checking a young teacher? I have an 11-year-old son named Adam. He's well-behaved 80% of the time, down from 90%. I know it's puberty kicking in and his brain is changing. I cut him a bit more slack, but I also don't put up with bullshit. Before the holiday break, we had a parent-teacher conference. My son's homeroom teacher, Mr. C, asked that Adam attend because he wanted to boost his autonomy in class or whatever the f*** that means. After 20 minutes of hearing how my son is doing better than most, then Adam came in for the last 10 minutes of the conference. Mr. C said he was going to be direct on how an incident he witnessed before school where he saw me yelling at him and Adam getting out of my car. He yelled at me to leave him alone and to stop following him. Then my son spent the whole day with his head down in class. Mr. C asked Adam how he felt that day, and my son said he was mad. Mr. C said, Dad, you need to step up. You lost your temper, and I don't want my students coming to class upset. Please respect that I'm bringing this up to you. I laughed and asked if his Spider-Man tie was cutting off circulation to his head. You damn right, I yelled at him. In that incident, Adam snuck his phone into his bedroom at night and spent all night on it. He got two hours of sleep on a Wednesday. I was pissed. Adam was in a foul mood because he was sleep deprived, so he clashed when I discussed it with him and told him I was putting restrictions on his phone. And I wasn't following him to school. It was a one-way street. How was my son scared of me when the following night he wanted to lay next to me so we could watch a movie? I asked Mr. C how many 11-year-old boys are you raising? He said none because he's 24. I said then don't dispense parroting advice to someone who is and has raised two other ones. Later, Adam said I was mean, but Mr. C asked for it. Am I the a-hole? Well, the sad stories just keep on rolling here. <laughs> It is, am I the a-hole? That's true. I don't know why I expect. <laughs> <laughs> it's a me problem. <laughs> so, OP, obviously you're a gigantic a-hole. You can see it in the story. As the teacher is pointing out to you that you berated your son, I guess in the parking lot, right before he goes into school? Correct. Now, over the reasons, obviously you have rules. He broke them. He didn't get any sleep. I can get that as a parent, but there are ways of going teaching your kids how to respect the rules that don't involve you yelling at them. And losing your temper. Yeah. You, you don't need to do any of that. You can talk to them because they're a human being just like you are. You don't need to do it with the anger because it sounds like ROP has an anger problem. Going about it the way you did is wrong. There are healthy ways to have discourse and you need to learn them. I understand from his point of view, he's going, well, I've already raised kids. So how dare you say anything to me? Just because you've raised them doesn't mean it was in the right way. But I am interested. Does he take any of the feedback or does he just keep fighting? Oh, he keeps fighting. Because he sounds combative and then he's not wrong. He kept fighting. And in fact, there was another commenter after our OP apparently stopped commenting back. There was another commenter that came forward and a lot of people believe that he was it was OP on another account <laughs> because of how much he was going into some of the details and some of the defensiveness. I think it's funny when people double down. That's so wild. And let me just go ahead. I'll give our verdict as well. It was our OP is definitely the a-hole here. And I think a lot of people mistook at least the ones that was 
essentially defending our OP. The teacher, I don't feel, had a problem that our OP would try and correct the bad behavior of his child. Sure. It was in the manner with which he was doing it that the teacher was trying to point out. Yes, you shouldn't be going about it that way. Not that you can't correct your kids, and you should. You should hold them accountable for the things that they do. That creates a good person down the road. But how you go about doing that will also impact the way they grow. I find it funny that you say that because one commenter said you didn't actually check the teacher. You just became the angry parent that all teachers talk about having to deal with. And in fact, they feel very sorry for the direction that Adam will probably head into if you're at the helm of teaching them. Well, see, the bigger issue here now is his son got to see his dad do that to someone else. And now you're asking for your son to respect other people outside of the home. How is he going to respect other people outside of the home when you don't respect other people outside of the home? Gant. I'm Tim Thomas. Are you ready to be sad for an hour and a half? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not sad. These are just true stories. Well, let's go ahead and head into our next story. And I'll bring it back to, let's do a bachelor party, shall we? For our next story. Am I the a-hole for backing out of my best friend's bachelorette trip because my boyfriend needed me? I apologize for any errors, kind of writing this post in a desperate state, so I'm sorry. Six months ago, my, 24 female, best friend Tess, 26 female, asked me to be her maid of honor for her wedding. We have been friends for years now, and I love her a lot. She has always been there for me, and we've been through a lot together. The one thing Tess was the most excited for was her bachelorette. She has been talking about it even before she got engaged, which is why I feel so guilty. I also helped her plan our Vegas trip, and we were supposed to leave this week. But a few days ago, Jason got laid off of work. Even though he saw it coming, it hit him hard. He's just stressed and really upset. He didn't even tell me at first because he didn't want me to be worried, but when he finally told me, I just knew I couldn't go anymore. I was really conflicted, and I knew what this meant to Tess, and that I'm the maid of honor, but I just couldn't even consider going to Vegas while Jason is this upset. He's a strong guy, but I felt like he shouldn't go through this alone. I worked up the courage to call Tess, and it just went so much worse than I planned. Tess thought I was joking at first, and then she just became really angry, which is understandable, but I wish she understood my situation too. Tess at first told me to do whatever and cut the call. She didn't respond when I tried contacting her again. After that, she sent me a lot of messages saying that I'm stealing her special day and started questioning why I accepted to be maid of honor if I didn't want to do the duties that came along with it. She said I'm untrustworthy and jealous, that I'm ruining her special moment for a guy I've only known for a year. I'll admit, I usually don't accept Tess's offers to go clubbing, and she blames that on Jason being controlling, but in reality, I've explained that I just turned into a homebody because I never really enjoyed that stuff in the first place. I still go out with her a lot. I make sure I'm there for her. But for her bachelorette, I was willing to do that and more. I really did want to go and make it special. She told me that her whole plan will fall through because I was the one with the plan. I told her I'll explain it all to one of our other friends, but she said I don't have to because I'm no longer her friend. That hurt a lot to hear. On one hand, I don't regret my decision. Jason needs me, and Tess should understand how difficult this is for us. But also... This is a once-in-a-lifetime trip, and she has been dreaming about it since forever. I'm also the one who planned a lot of the stuff. Our mutuals also reached out to let me know that Tess is very angry and that what I did was not cool. Now I'm doubting myself, and I need to know if I have to apologize. I obviously can't ask anyone I know. Jason thinks I'm right, and I'm sure Derek and the bridesmaids think Tess is right. So that is why this post, thank you if you're trying to help me. I'm not going to try to help you. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's not for me. You explain how important you are to your friend and how much planning and excitement is around this once, hopefully in a lifetime event. 
for you and your friends. You're going to Vegas. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. The worst saying ever. <laughs> but you bail out. Is it a couple of days before, like the week before this trip? Essentially. And it's only for a weekend trip. Okay. It's only for a couple of days. Correct. And you bail out of something that I'm sure took a minute to put together. Jason probably would have been a okay had you missed a couple days with him. But he lost a job that he already knew he was going to lose. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of details in here where I'm like, wait, he knew he was going to be laid off. Now, don't get me wrong. That sucks. And you want to be there for your partner and all of that good stuff. Support is important. But if your boyfriend was as supportive as you are, he would have told you, hey, go enjoy those couple days. This is something that you've planned with your friend that is very important to all of you. But it doesn't sound like that's a part of his MO. No, in fact, he says our OP is right for ditching her friend. That's alarming. It kind of sounds like Jason is... Say it. <laughs> isolating you from your friends. <laughs> and that's not good. Now, we don't understand the extent of their relationship and they don't give us a lot of details. So I, maybe me assuming that is a little too much, but just based off of these little details, it sounds like it's unhealthy. Given all of the information, you clearly know that you're an a-hole. I don't know if it's so much ROP though, because she sounds like a very put together and caring person. But maybe Jason has learned that about her and is manipulating her into making crappy choices. She's still the a-hole. I'm just saying that it's a little easier when you're being puppeteered. Well, you and a few Redditors are on the same page. Good. I'm happy I'm not the only one that suspects that Jason's a dish. That there might be emotional manipulativeness in this relationship that should be ringing red flags for our OP. That's definitely what it sounds like to me. And it's at the... Detriment to a long friendship. And that's gross. Hopefully the comments gave ROP some food for thought and maybe she can reassess her relationship going forward and the boundaries that her boyfriend is so readily able to push through. <laughs> and you're dancing around. Because so. I'm looking forward to actually reading some of these Redditor comments. <laughs> Let's hear it. All right. So the first one that made me smile was deaf, not made of honor. Yeah. <laughs> the consensus on Reddit was that our OP is the a-hole. In fact, as I've insinuated to you before, you are online with a lot of our Redditors and the warnings of these red flags in her relationship, especially considering that your boyfriend of less than a year is essentially, yes, alienating you from a friendship that you've had for years now, that it's very odd. There's no medical emergency, no family issues going on. He lost his job, which is pretty bad, but he was already made aware that that was happening. He couldn't just tell you, go enjoy the weekend with your friends and I will see you when you come back. I'll go hang out with my family and my own friends in the meantime. He needed someone to catch his tears. Oh, that reminds me of another comment that another Redditor put down in which they say, why? If it is not detrimental for her to stay behind... Would he insist that she not go and enjoy this long planned item with her friend? One commenter, which is my favorite so far, says he needs help with unloading his penis while his hands and tissues are wiping away his tears. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> but regardless, there was another commenter who answered them and essentially was saying, look, you're getting downvoted, not because you're asking whether you should apologize, but the fact that you're even asking if you should apologize. They said, look, if your boyfriend, who's a grown ass adult, sees that he's coming and is clearly trying to destroy a lifetime friendship because of his feelings, seriously, there's a lot of red flags there you should really look into. Yeah, definitely. The second one, it says, if this relationship with, hold on, checks notes, Jason is a healthy one, then your prioritization of a boyfriend of less than a year shows that you have a massive character defect and that you actually need to look into 
checking that out. Another one says, you should actually see how you're phrasing all of this and truly be mortified. And the fact that you're leaving this up shows that you don't actually feel bad about raining on your friend's parade. Because if you don't think that this isn't going to put a cloud over what's supposed to be a happy memory in her life, you got another thing coming. You as her maid of honor backed out. You who did all the planning because that's what makes you the maid of honor. And the fact that you pulled out, now she's disinvited you and it's going to put a forever stain on what's supposed to be a memorable part of potentially getting married. You're supposed to have your bachelor and bachelorette. It's supposed to be fun with friends. Your last hurrah and then you get married and then you have different hurrahs in the future. So does it sound like she was able to see what people were trying to point out to her? No, it looked like she stopped answering once... Someone pointed out to her just how messed up it was that she pulled out the way that she did. I have to hope that maybe she'll start to look into what's been changing in her life. We don't know, Jason, truly. We're only assuming. And a lot of individuals try and correlate things based on what makes the most sense. For all we know, Jason's a great person. And it could really just be a character defect that's on the OP. And maybe things have changed for them so much so that they're just, they just don't want to be a good friend anymore. We truly don't know all of this. It's kind of just assumptions on our end. What we can say is when something smells fishy, it usually is. Well, let's go on to our next story and see about traditional values. Am I the a-hole for leaving my fiance because my body count does not align with his traditional values? So let me get right into the story. I, 21 female, got engaged to my ex, 24 male, in late June of 2023. We met earlier that year, and I thought that he was everything I've ever wanted in a man. Living in the big city alone and working my ass off while going to uni, I have met a few guys who I've messed around with. To be exact, since my first time, I have slept with five more guys, including my fiance, so my body count is was six all in all. When we first met, he was the most amazing and loving guy I have ever met. We have talked through our relationships before each other, and he didn't seem to mind that much. I have to say that he is a really traditional Christian guy who lives on a farm, and I like that about him, the peaceful life he was living. We talked about everything, kids, marriage, etc. But after we got engaged, he started acting differently. His best friend and soon-to-be best man, 19 male, tried hooking up with me before I met my boyfriend. So I guess out of jealousy, he started filling my boyfriend's head with all kinds of things about my body count. For example, man, she was sleeping with one of the F boys I know, and he only sleeps with hoes. But she is a nice girl. I don't know what to think about her. And yes, I met a guy in 2022 who was exactly my type physically, and we hooked up in 2022. Never seen or heard from him after that. After a few months later, my boyfriend started acting like he was entitled to my body. Even if I wasn't ready or feeling like I wanted to be intimate, at the exact moment he wanted that. He would bring out how I slept with a bunch of guys before him. Then he told me that he only slept with one girl before me. So we had a lot of fights about that, but I wanted to let that go and work on our relationship and marriage that was about to start. We talked and talked, and whenever I did something that was not how he wanted it, he would bring up my body count. I got sick of that, really, but the fights only started getting worse. He used to tell me that I would not be fit to be the mother of his children, but in other moments, he would dream about that and fantasize our life. His excuse for saying and insulting me was that his moral and religious beliefs don't align with my past life and that sometimes he breaks out because of that. I tried to understand that, tried to work on my relationship with him, and even pleaded for forgiveness. I know how stupid of me. But when I moved in with him and we had a fight about my body count again and again, the last drop was his mother joining the argument. In exact words, she said, If you were some mafia-tattooed guy, she would be more respectful of you. The next girl you bring home will first go through your sister and my own hands. 
meaning they would test her if she is a proper wife. That was when I've had enough of that bullshit. I called my mom and stepdad to pick me up. It was 1 a.m. and they drove for four hours to get me home. Him and his mom apologized to me, begged me to come back. But after some of the talks with my mom, I realized that things were never going to change. Even though I loved that guy and was willing to do everything to make the relationship work. After a month, he reached out to me, tried to mend our relationship, saying that if I really loved him, I would come back and he promised to never speak of my previous relationships ever again. Well, you know from the title I didn't go back to him, but am I the a-hole for leaving him? What a gross story. <laughs> <laughs> I am happy for our OP because regardless of one's body count, whether it be one or whether it be a hundred, when you get into a relationship and it sounds like she disclosed hers when they talked about it at the beginning, if someone cannot take you for what you are at that moment, once you've disclosed it, that is the end. Because of the mere fact that he engaged with you after that, said he accepted it. But he ended up weaponizing that to guilt and own you. So nothing grossed me out more than when she said that he felt that she felt that he was entitled to her body. Ugh. And that's how he weaponized it by shaming you. But the fact that he kept bringing it up means it bothered him and it was never going to be good enough. Avoid these type of people in your life. I'm happy that you had family that was willing to drive four hours and come and get you. No one should accept being shamed by their past if their partner accepted that at the beginning. So OP, you are not the a-hole. So the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is definitely not the a-hole. In fact, I have an update. Oh. So let me go ahead and read that for you. So I saw some of the people who thought that I cheated on my ex or that I made the story up so let me tell you a little bit more about it. I did not cheat on him. The guy that I had a one night stand, we had been messaging for months before that happened with was like a year before we got into a relationship. The best friend of my ex knew the guy. That is why my ex and him talked about it. This is not a fake story. It took me two months to get this off my chest and talk about it. I have lost friends because of this guy who I'm reconnecting with right now. I am reconnecting with my old friends. I am thankful to those who are supportive of me in real life as much as I am to those on this platform. I was just going for a walk with my friend N, 25 male, who knows my ex, and he was shocked when I told him the reason. We are not from the U.S. We are Balkan. So posting screenshots won't mean much because a majority would not understand the native language. His mom called my mom. Yes, a week ago, his toxic mom called mine, apologizing and begging her to let me come back to be their daughter-in-law. Of course, my mom politely denied her offer and blocked her number. The reason why she wanted me back is because no one ever loved his son as much as me and I have many talents I could pass down on her grandchildren. Hell no. I blocked him and his best friend. Atta girl. I will say, it never really struck me that our OP cheated, so I was really kind of baffled about that, but I'm really glad that she clarified it. In fact, in all caps, I'm really glad that she took commenter's advice and decided to block everybody regarding this whole issue. I think it's very silly when it comes to, honestly, the whole body count game, your experiences as you go from relationship to relationship, those are your experiences. And it should not be held against you that you had these moments. If someone's not willing to accept you fully, then they shouldn't have started a relationship with you to begin with. And that's what it comes down to is you're allowed to have what your values are. If you say, I don't want someone with X amount of over a body count, you're allowed to be that person. But what you're not allowed to do is get in a relationship with someone who you know is over that count and then use that to emotionally manipulate them. I must say, though, there is something unhinged about her ex. Because to go from saying that the woman that you're with is not suitable to be the mother of your children to fantasizing about her being the mother of your children. If there's something that's not wrong there... 
color me purple and call me avatar <laughs> aren't they blue oh i thought they were purple <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they're purple. Maybe they're purple blue. It's like a purple blue color. But regardless, I'm just, nope. Nope. (laughs) Well, I say stay strong, OP. And let's go right into our last story. Am I the a-hole for telling my wife that her relationship with her brother is strange and I won't tolerate it anymore? My wife, 23 female, and I, 24 male, have been married for five years, together for eight years. One of the problems I currently have is her relationship with her brother, 25 male, single. From the beginning of our relationship, they were very close, as their parents were neglectful, and I observed that they became very attached. This wasn't a problem, but in recent months, it's become extremely uncomfortable. Firstly, every time he visits us several times a month, my wife turns into a different person. She cleans more, cooks for him, almost never cooks otherwise, actually serves food to her brother, picks up his dishes and washes them, is willing to go out and do things, etc. Secondly, she becomes uncomfortably physical with her brother. It starts with reoccurring big hugs. Then, when we watch TV together, she holds hands or cuddles with him on the couch while I'm in a chair. When we go for walks, she holds his hand and chats with him while I walk behind them, the same thing in the car. She also lies in the same bed as him, cuddling slash holding his hand and talking to him while I'm in the apartment. She also tried to make it seem like it's no big deal if her big brother sleeps in the same bed as her. For comparison, she shows a bit more physical affection to him than to me. When I talked to her about their relationship getting weird, she immediately got defensive and called me insecure, as well as disgusting for suggesting that their relationship is bordering on something else, which I did not imply. After a lot of circling discussions, I said I couldn't tolerate it anymore, and she got angry, saying I can't interfere in that. Right now, we're not speaking. Her brother also seems irritated with me. Am I the a-hole? What the weird spicy meatball we're eating today? (laughs) I'm missing something here because it sounds like OP might be seeing something. They said there's a lot of very intimate things being shared between the siblings. How old are they? The wife is 23. Our OP is 24. The brother is 25. Okay. So initially I thought maybe because I forgot the ages. (laughs) I thought initially that the brother was a little brother. I thought maybe this was like a 24, 23 year old sister, older sister, and that the brother that was coming over was like 10 and under kind of thing, you know, holding hands and those type of things. You could see that. But now that you told me that we're talking about a 24 year old sister and a 25 year old brother, 23, 23 year old, whoever, (laughs) it's an issue. (laughs) They're in the same bed talking to each other and holding hands, I guess. And sleeping. And, you know. Our OP does say it's nothing sexual, though. He's never. It's like they lay in bed, they talk, and then they fall asleep while he's in the apartment. That's a little more intimate than I think I've ever seen a brother and sister relationship. That's older. That's healthy. Yes. And older. Based off of what he's telling us. No matter what situation you're in, you're allowed to speak to your significant other about what's concerning you. So no, you're not the a-hole. So the consensus on Reddit is that our OP is not the a-hole. However, people who have experience in similar type situations came forward saying tread carefully though and seek professional counsel on this. This sounds a lot like trauma bonding between siblings. And it doesn't just happen between siblings. Sometimes it can happen between two really close friends or a parent and a child, but generally what happens is it's almost a bonding that happens between them that pushes beyond healthy boundaries. Yeah. And for a lot of people looking in can almost look incestual-like. Okay. Now, we don't know what's going on. This is only from our OP and his perspective But one Redditor said, look into this, especially if the shift has only happened recently. This isn't normal. OP says everything revolves around this. 
there was a sudden change. This wasn't something common that I used to observe in their relationship. Now, OP says that he will seek marriage counseling and that he would talk to her about her and her brother also seeking therapy. But he's very glad that individuals have provided a perspective that this might not be... What he initially thought. Right. That his feelings of it being uncomfortable, it isn't potentially just in his head. It could be something more that needs to be looked into. Sure. And needs to have more professionalism to go ahead and possibly untangle. There was one individual that actually said in the comment section that they trauma bonded with their mother. Apparently, she... And her mother were dealing with a very abusive, I guess it would be her father and her mother's husband. And it caused them both to trauma bond with each other. And it took a lot of professional help and patience to unravel the unhealthy boundaries that was between these two individuals. It's sort of just a coping mechanism between people. Well, that wasn't quite our last story. I wanted us to leave today with something a little better tasting in our mouths because the stories today were a little rough, weren't they? They're always rough. They are, aren't they? So let me go ahead and take us to the Relationship Advice Forum and see if I can end us off with a funny situation, potentially. Okay. I, 35 male, keep getting ghosted right after they visit my apartment, including after a recent date, 30 female. Everything goes well up to that point. Is there something I should do differently? Am I a chair fascist? So she came over to my apartment, right? And kept bugging me about where is the sofa or chair or a stool. I explained to her about how sitting on the floor is actually better. Then I relaxed into a nice resting squat on my Zafu meditation pillow and encouraged her to make herself comfortable. She ditches the date early and hasn't responded to my messages since. My friend, 40 male, from work says it is because I am a chair fascist, but I think that can't be it. If anything, being chair free is like a useful filter to reject those handful of people who really are crazy. What are we talking about? <laughs> Someone that doesn't like chairs? Someone that does not like chairs. He's having a problem because he's inviting women over and they're asking him why he doesn't have chairs. Where's your couch? Where's a chair or a stool? So if that's how you want to live, you're more than welcome to. But your opinion about other people living <laughs> with chairs, I guess, is an issue. Because now you have this weird complex of you being better than. I think for me anyway, that's what turns me off from those type of people. Like I love hearing about how other folks live. And that would be cool up until I found out you thought I was beneath you because I like to sit in chairs. So maybe that's where people are coming at. So we'll get down to the crux. You're 35. You're bringing women over to your apartment and they see that there is no furniture. Basically. Not anywhere as far as the eye can see, but one pillow. Normally, that's an alarm bell for a lot of folks. <laughs> and even if because, look, it sounds like maybe this is his feng shui. This is how he likes to live. All you have to do in this day and age is when you're on your Tinder, just put, I don't believe in chairs. <laughs> I mean, you might find the perfect person. You never know. I don't know how those things work. That was invented after we got together. So who knows? Maybe putting that on there, you might find someone else that also goes, I also like hunching over a, a pillow. What do you do if you go to a restaurant? Do you refuse to sit in a chair? You stand. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not hating on it. I'm not trying to, I'm not belittling it or trying to make fun of it. But I guess if you want to live that way, you can, but you have to find the right, you can't expect for other people to walk in your house and go, I accept this. I think this whole situation's funny. Honestly, you saw me cackling last night when I pulled up this story, Timsterdamas, and you were wondering what was up. Yep. Because all I kept imagining is I'm going on this nice date with this gentleman and everything's going well. So, so much so that I agree to go back to his place because I'm like, everything's clicking right. He's nice. He's smart. We had a lot of fun. We probably went dancing and I'm just like, now I just want to sit down and get to know him a little better. I walk into his place. Lo and behold, there's nothing there. 
Does he even live here? <laughs> Where are we? Are you Ted Bundy? Wow, you <laughs> went down a rabbit hole. <laughs> this is because of a commenter. Let me actually read their comment. They said, if I, 41 female, went on a date with you and we went back to your place and there was no furniture, I would never go on a date with you again because one, I would think you're creepy and going to murder me since it seems like you don't really live in the apartment because where is the furniture? Two, if I got past the thought that you aren't going to Ted Bundy me, then I still wouldn't get over the fact that you don't care about others' comfort and I would never picture myself in your current lifestyle. Tip, find a girl that likes to hang out on the floor and is an adult first, then ask her for a date. For the love of women, don't bamboozle our hopes and dreams of a nice normal guy to date by bringing us back to your empty and sad cave. <laughs> What? I must say, I like that she says, is an adult first. <laughs> she has to specify anybody that sits on the floor it has to be an adult first. Oh. But, but there's a lot of women that came out saying, look, I like hanging out on the floor. When I watch stuff, when I enjoy things, I tend to just chill out on the floor, but I still would not be comfortable going into somebody's place and seeing it bare bones, nothing except for a pillow. And they said that they've gone into a place where They've enjoyed sitting and it's, yes, it's on the floor, but there's a bunch of pillows for guests yeah. to go ahead and enjoy. If you're essentially telling your date that you get the only thing to sit on and everybody else sits on the floor, that seems like a really weird power move. I can see it. Uh, maybe if you're on the date, yes, first filter people out, put it on your profile. Say you like non-chairs and maybe you'll find someone that is into that situation, but if you don't, right, if they're not just out there growing on trees, when you do get in that first date scenario, maybe go ahead and tell them. See, my issue is how do you go from, because normally you don't get from like date to someone's place in like 10 minutes. Normally you have to talk a couple dates, you know, you're getting to know each other. My issue comes when they're on these dates. She's never seen him sit down once. That's what I'm trying to get to. It's like, <laughs> hold on. Are these all making sure, did he make sure that every single date you went on, it was only where you guys could be standing and non-sit? At a bar. How did he get you to that point where you were comfortable and you walked in and you were shocked? They went on so many picnics. You still, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird that this guy only requested picnics. <laughs> <laughs> it's a picnic boo-boo. <laughs> Listen to the advice. I Make sure you... Uh, disclose some of these things first and maybe you won't have such a hard time because look for every ying there is a yang that is true if you definitely have those interests i bet you other people would probably be chair facets too out there in the world i'm not coming to your house <laughs> <laughs> well was that our last story that was our last story that didn't sit quite right with me <laughs> <laughs> i see what you did there so as our stories come to a close don't forget you see in the world what you carry in your heart if you have enjoyed listening to us read and talk about today's stories, please rate, subscribe, and turn on notifications for new content. We regularly post on Mondays. We would also like to announce our pet of the week. Carly shared with us her amazing companion, Pumpkin. In this, we actually learned that Pumpkin is two years old, meows loud when she comes home from work, and loves to cuddle. Her favorite toys are a pickle and hair ties. And Carly actually introduced us to Pickle back in October in one of our paranormal episodes. If anybody's interested in reading about it, we actually pinned it in the comment section of that story, A Haunting Tours. It's actually a very sweet and insightful story. It, it is. And I'm really glad that we got to see Pumpkin. Pumpkin is a very handsome cat. His coloring is very beautiful. Very unique. I like it. I would also love to thank all of our patrons for your continued support. Yes, we love and appreciate every single one of you. Well, listeners, I usually leave you this question on a Fridays, but since we only post on Mondays, I guess I'll ask it here. What did you guys do over the weekend? Ooh, I can't wait to hear the exciting things that happened. I was so glad that we decided to stay in and played uh, this game on PlayStation. Nobody saves the world. If you haven't played it, I definitely suggest it. Voice cannot get enough of it. I can't. It's so silly and so twisted. I love it. As always, listeners, we look forward to hearing your opinions in the comments below. 
What did you think about the stories today? And remember, if you post it, maybe we'll see it on the internet. Human chair. <laughs>